So Pastor George asked if I could uh, speak today in the theme of, of the healing and the wholeness that we've been talking about through this detox series that we were doing. And the last one of the detox series is going to be next Sunday. Um, so you don't want to miss that. But today, as you can probably see, the title is Walking Out Your Freedom. So Pastor George asked me to, to speak on this today. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. Sound good? I think that, you know, we hear testimonies sometimes that, you know, you just hear the remarkable parts, right? You hear the God met me and... Or, and, and I was free, you know, and you hear these remarkable, remarkable stories that of people being delivered and then instantly being catapulted into some kind of victorious walk. <laughs> but we don't usually hear the process that it took to get there because that would be probably a few days worth. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important that we recognize the walking out part because if we don't how do we recognize how to walk out freedom in our life deliverance is quick deliverance is easy yes it's easy but then you leave and you go home and then what right so this morning, I'm going to ask Pastor Dan to come up here. If any of you saw, saw the, uh, my post uh, on our like page, I said that we were going to have an awesome testimony come forth this morning. Did anyone read that? I'm just testing to see who reads it. Awesome. One person read it. So the rest of you are surprised <laughs> that we have a testimony <laughs> coming forth. So who was here on Friday at the 10-year uh, celebration? Awesome. So a lot of you had heard a little bit of, of um, I'll help you in a minute if you need. At the, yeah. So many of you heard, um, have heard Pastor Dan's testimony even years ago. Um, I think we asked you probably seven years ago to share it, maybe six or seven years ago. And so many of you might have heard it then, but some of you heard it already uh, on Friday. But you really probably heard the mostly I came to let go I got ministries I was set free and now I'm on worship right so I wanted to yeah and that's awesome but I think people can get discouraged if that didn't happen like that for them right but the reality is is that I think that it's important to sometimes talk out uh, how it took to get there uh, and not everyone's story is going to be like Pastor Dan's. We all have our own story. So I'm going to ask Pastor Dan a few questions just to kind of stir him up. And, and I did throw these out to him ahead of time so he could just really be ready for today. I don't know, Pastor Dan, if you have shared too much of um, really the, the difficult parts of the journey or how, how you, know, you went from eight years ago coming here for the first time and then today uh, where you're at. It's, it's, it's really quite a journey, I think. Can you recap for us, first of all, where you were at prior to coming here eight years ago? Uh, because I think it's important for people to understand uh, what God has, has pulled you out of and, and put you into. Can you explain that? Yeah, I was... Is it on? Tess? How do you work these things? Mine doesn't have a switch. <laughs> okay. um, <laughs> so, I don't know. It's hard to... Do I don't know how far to go back, but I remember the, the months before hand were probably some of the worst. So, I'll just start with that, because before, before I came here, like... Because it was pretty much going downhill, like... I remember feeling just, in, like, terrible anxiety and just not knowing what to do with it, so just medicate with alcohol. And, uh, yeah, just a downward spiral from there, just, like, drinking and acting out in just weird ways and being depressed and then remembering what I did the night before and then, and then saying I wouldn't do it again and then do it again. And this, the patterns would go on like that with even, like, what relationship, relationships, like, the relationships, the relationships I was in, like, friends I was around. It just, the choices in that circle, you just... 
you seem to just make the same bad self-destructive choices and that's kind of where I was going. And then I remember lying in bed when I just thinking, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like, something's got to change. So I just, I just lie there, put my arm there, I'm like, God, and you have to, you have to change us, basically. I need to change. And then I think a couple weeks later, I came to like, oh, like God. So you said you, you cried out to God. Was that, um, so you obviously knew him somewhat. Were you a Christian at that time? I was raised in a Christian home, but didn't really know anything about the relationship or the power of God. It just wasn't really, it was like where I'm from, Steinbach area, it's just, just never really heard about it. And it was like, I don't know, I just wasn't there. On Friday at, the, at our 10-year uh, anniversary, I know you mentioned drugs as well was a part of your lifestyle. Was that, was that in your life for quite a number of years, or was that the moment right before coming here? No, it was, it was on and off for a number of years, just doing it and then realizing, hey, this is getting too far, and then pulling back, and then, and then doing it again, and then pulling back. And like, the, like, there was always a pattern, like bad things would happen in your life. Okay, I'm going to start drinking heavy, mm -hmm. or I'll start doing this now, or, you know, just... On Friday, you mentioned um, some actually pretty heavy drugs. Was, did that become an addiction to you, or was that something that, like you say, was more of a pattern? It wasn't something that I was like, like you hear these stories of people like, oh, I'll, this drug destroyed my life. It wasn't really like, like I wasn't really totally controlled by the drugs. It was, it was like, it was, I knew it was wrong, and I wanted to keep control of it. Control of it. I was using it to medicate the anxiety and the, and the depression. Yeah. yeah. So how did you hear about us? Like Go Like God Ministries? I, through my sister, which I think she heard about it through Chandra. Yeah. So she had some freedom here and told you to come? Is yeah, that she, how it worked? Yeah, something like that. She was, <laughs> she was experiencing freedom that she had been depressed for a number of years and, and uh, she encouraged me to come because we had a, we had a connection in that way because we both were pretty miserable. <laughs> people and so I'm like if she's getting help and she believes in it I'll try it she has a pretty awesome <laughs> testimony yeah. too yeah um, when you were in that state uh, that you described before coming here mm -hmm. was there a place where you still had hope and dreams for your future or were you at a place where you just couldn't <clears throat> even think that far I felt pretty low about myself my future just to me looked kind of like dim and useless and kind of, I don't know, like financially I never had money. Like it just seemed like that, it was going to be like that way the rest of my life. I didn't really, I wanted, to, I wanted to change but I didn't know how, like there was, the knowledge wasn't there. Like, uh, you, know. you felt hopeless? Yeah. So tell us, uh, what can you tell us I should say, because I know some things we don't, we don't, uh, some things are personal, you know, and, and, and I don't want you to say more than you are feel free to say or you want to share. Um, but when you first came here, um, can you, what can you tell us about, about how that kind of, how that looked for you in that first visit? Did, was there like a, an instant f feeling of freedom? Uh, did it take a few visits? How, how did that look for you? For, for me, the first time I can tell, like I was kind of testing, like the... You know, I felt like, I felt like, you know, like, I don't know, like, like I'm going to see what this is all about because I, I was pretty skeptical and, but I came with open heart, I think still because Pastor George had prophesied, he had a word of knowledge for me and then, um, then he prayed for me after and I just automatically felt peace come over me and uh, from then on I didn't want to let go because I never had peace. So I'm like, I'm going to grab hold of this because this is better than anything, but I don't, know. I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. Is the peace of God is a tough thing to explain. Yeah. How, how many weeks do you think it took for deliverance to take place? Well, it's still taking place, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, like the major deliverance, I don't know. Yeah. It was over a course of months. It wasn't just like coming in and being like, oh, I'm here, let's do worship. It was like my spirit, in my, like in my spirit I felt like there was, there was conflict but I felt peace in that conflict. That's, and I think doing worship and, and attending here was keeping me going mm -hmm. and that's, and yeah. Was it like, do you remember how many weeks it was? Like I know, I remember you came and then it was, it felt like, like right away, Pastor George asked you if you could do so, lead some worship songs. And, and I remember you saying you had never, you didn't know any worship songs. Um, can you describe that a little bit, how that came about? <clears throat> 
<laughs> I think it's funny how that's how he remembers it. But <laughs> I know he said that. I, I did actually know some worship songs. I just never performed them, I guess you could say. Like, I had played worship songs before. Sorry to make Pastor George look like a liar. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what I understood, too. That's just how he remembers it. And I, just, I kept on thinking, I should actually tell him that. I actually had played some worship songs before. <laughs> had, you, had you led worship before? And most, mostly it was just like maybe mocking worship songs. Like, I remember, mo- yeah, I was bad. And like, yeah. I, play, I, would, I, would, I remember playing Shout to the Lord and just like singing it all dumb. I think maybe even Chandra can remember that. <laughs> so you may not have been leading worship no, at that I just, moment? No, I never, like, I didn't really perform the songs. Like, I didn't just learn them to, to do them. I don't know. I, I knew how to play them, some of them. But I'd been to camp. So and when I, you, I'm ready. <laughs> so I remember, and I know Pastor George spoke about some of this, uh, you know, on Friday too, but not everyone was here Friday, plus there's people on, online that, that haven't heard any of this, so we're, we're recapping some of it, but, mm. but the, um, I, I remember you, the presence of God being, being so strong and, and you mm. not oh, knowing how to always handle it, even when you were leading worship. I remember, I think, didn't you even fall down one time when, while uh, you were leading worship? No, I think I almost fell. There was, there was lots of times where I was pretty much falling over, but... That was, it, <laughs> it was, was pretty close. awesome. So I didn't you... want to break my guitar. <laughs> 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 So you had, but you had to learn how to handle the presence of God. Yeah, it's, it was intense. Like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it other than like I felt like the grace of God was on me. Like, cause I think, cause I was being obedient and I was attending and I was, I was, I had an open heart. I wanted to change. And I think that was a big thing that, <clears throat> like, and I didn't really have any knowledge of like religion because I wasn't, I just didn't really know anything. Like, I didn't go to church for years and I just kind of had a. You know, I had a pretty open heart. I think that really helped. <clears throat> Did you have to make any any lifestyle choices to uh, to continue walking out that freedom that you had started? Oh, right away, I started to recognize the people I was hanging around was why I was doing the things I was doing. So I kind of weaned them out of my life. And was it tough? That yeah, it was tough because at that point in my life, I was younger and. <clears throat> friends meant a lot more to me than they do now. Like, they kind of defined you. Whereas now, I, just, I feel confident enough in who I am and God that I don't need that. I, that's something I have pain through healing too. So that, that was a big one. So did you, was that like a, a quick thing for you to make that change or was that a bit of a process? That was a process, but it wasn't like, it wasn't, it was over a short period of time, but <clears throat> it, it was easy, it was easy, it was clear and clear to see every day with more healing and, <clears throat> knowing that how, like if I was going to stay free that I need, would need to stay away from those kinds of things and it was easy because I felt peace you know I felt the presence of God and mm-hmm. I felt every right, right decision I made was a step closer to healing and I felt I felt that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's really awesome it's um mm-hmm. I think that that's that's powerful what you just said for mm-hmm. for people to hear that and really understand that when your heart longs for God more you know, and you and you walk into that, that it, it just really does stir in you and replaces those <clears throat> those uh, <clears throat> those longings maybe of the past or the you know the um, the the strongholds. We'll just say it that way. Mm-hmm. So so were you like instantly? You know, sometimes because the testimony, the short testimony <clears throat> is you were delivered and you're on worship. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> We all know as human beings that it doesn't always work that way, and it didn't probably. But was there, a, was there a time in that transition where you felt pulled back by the temptations of old to go back to that? Of any, and and you, you don't necessarily have to share details if you don't want to, but, but was it, was it uh, like in that first year, for example, was it tough to not enter back into old patterns or old addictions or things like that? <clears throat> I don't think I sent that question to him. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I, I definitely, I definitely felt the the pull and the struggle, but I don't know how else to explain. But the peace and the, the presence of God, it just it was it filled me up. But I feel like I didn't need it. So it's like the, it's like a craving that was like you know it's like smoking. You know when the craving's gone, you have the habit. I felt like just the habit was needed to break. I don't know. That's really really awesome. That's yeah. that's not everyone's testimony, and I yeah. think that that, that wasn't is... all. That wasn't everything, but the main the thing. <clears throat> I felt like God. You know, I think God knew what I needed to change. Like he, the part that 
the turmoil with me well, that wanted to, that the self-destructive part that wanted to, you know, medicate itself so I wouldn't feel that anxiety or that depression, like, that definitely left fairly quick. So that, that was a big one that, that helped me stop, the, stop drinking and doing drugs. So how about the renewing of your mind? Did that, did that seem like a really instant thing or did that take your time? to renew your mind to things of God and, and remo renew your mind to old, old patterns of addictions or relationships or those kinds of things? No, there was definitely some old thinking patterns that were <laughs> really, you know, you don't realize it then, but they just kind of go away after time. But there was definitely ways I thought about the world and the way I seen it that like lifted slowly and that you slowly recognize. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What can you share with us that, that, you, that you feel is the... Um, maybe some key things that, that really, really kept you to, to, together with God's heart and really kept you in that place of, of, wa of walking out freedom? I think being surrounded by believers is huge. I think as soon as you're alone and you're left to your own opinions and your own thoughts and then you, sometimes you find people who are like you and you I don't, I don't know. I think it's, it's a dangerous place to be when you're by yourself. And I think, like, being surrounded by a church family, like, with, with a group of believers that, like, leaders that you, that you believe in and you can trust, there's nothing better than that to, to keep on going. And you connected here, like, yeah. like you, like, the faithfulness, seriously, that, that we saw, like, you, like, I think there's maybe a handful of times that you've missed in the last eight years uh, and maybe not even a handful, and um, and that can't have always been easy because sometimes it's it's easy just to maybe stay home and sleep in. But but you <clears throat> you had a drive in you to come, you know, and you pushed through. Probably even times you didn't feel like it. Were, was there times you didn't feel like coming? Well, some, someone had to do worship, right? <laughs> <laughs> but every time Pastor Dan missed, there was always a good reason, like, you know, his honeymoon or vacation or, or, with Or Joanne hockey or something. <laughs> Even when he had a hockey game, he'd come here first, and then he'd leave... Uh, a little bit early to go play hockey so I mean the commitment is huge and and even you know we'd go we'd travel different places and you'd come with and and you know I, even driving through some storms sometimes sometimes we just couldn't do it but but the commitment was there do you think that helped you I, th I think I've been kind of guys that go harder to go home so when I start something I tend to go all the way and especially when it's something I believe in like, I don't know, I just, it was hard not, what is that clicking sound? A battery sign? What if, did that help? <laughs> Seemed to help. I don't know where I was. Oh. Hey. Now I don't know where I am. Commitment. Yes. Everyone should commit here. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm lost. Okay, I'll ask you another um, so, do you have dreams now? Do you have hope for your future now? You don't have to say what they are if you don't want to. Can I just say yes? Yeah, Sweet. Yes. <laughs> awesome. That's a good answer. One last question, Pastor Dan. Do you have any advice for people today that are walking, struggling to walk out their freedom? Maybe they've Maybe they've experienced some healing in their life or some deliverance in their life or some freedom in their life, but maybe, maybe it's tough for them right now because the old patterns want to pull them back to the past. Do you have any advice for them? I would advise to find a safe place like, like, uh, like, oh, like God and just commit to, to healing. Just open your heart and just come with an open mind and just believe that God's going to meet you. And uh, you know, just 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 root somewhere, and uh, like it's it's gonna help majorly in your life. Amen. Thank you. It's not an easy thing to come up and and be vulnerable and share share some of your stories. So we we really appreciate it, Pastor Dan. Thank you. Um, that was good, hey. It's good to hear some more details, I think, because it is, uh, it is a, um, 
the, the fact is, is that walking out freedom is a journey that all of us take and have to take really for the rest of our lives. That, that's a process that I believe gets easier, especially from, from a moment if you've, if you've had a major deliverance or, or a healing from God, but, but there's a freedom we need to walk out. And I believe that that, that, that freedom to walk, that we need to walk out is not just when we've maybe come from a tough place, you know, maybe we've, maybe we've had God um, do the miraculous in our lives, and, and so we have to, you know, learn how to walk out freedom from that, but maybe it's a place of coming out of religion and having to renew our minds to the things of God, and that is a process in itself as well. Maybe you had a lifetime of, of sickness, illness in your body, you know, and, and you've learned how to live with, uh, with that sickness, and you've learned how to cope, but you know, even after receiving healing from that, there is a process that, that needs to be taken to uh, continue to renew our minds and learn how to live new. You know, because you're, I think that that's why sometimes it's easy. Um, you know, we can't judge someone who, let's, let's, let's say something in the obvious. What if there's somebody who's been in a wheelchair for most of their life? And, you know, because we're walking, we're thinking, well, wouldn't you want to get out of that wheelchair? You know, we're thinking, of course you do. Let's pray for you and get you out of there. But the reality is, is that, and that's just one example, but the reality is, is that when you've grown accustomed to something in your life, and that's your only way that you know how to live, um, and you have learned how to cope in that, that it's a tough thing to then visualize what it would look like in life to be able to walk with your legs, to be able to do things that, that normally you wouldn't have been able to do and to be able to walk the freedom out in that. And so I think that no matter where we are in life, we have to look at um, not judging people, but really coming, coming to an understanding that we're all on a different journey and helping each other walk out our freedom, helping each other renew our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs crucified on a tree. So Christ purchased our freedom. And because he purchased our freedom and he redeemed us, the reality is that sometimes I, sometimes I think as believers, we have this idea that because Christ purchased our freedom, that it's all instantaneous. And then we get really hard on ourselves when we don't see more freedom that day. Is that right? Do you guys get hard on yourselves when you wish you would have done a little bit better or done a little bit more? Yeah, it's normal. We're human. And my heart for you today is to be able to remove that condemnation, as this scripture says, that, he, that Christ purchased our freedom, and he, rem and he removed the condemnation and the guilt of, of those day-to-day -day things. We need to be able to remove that and really accept what Jesus did on the cross for us. Because I think that when we turn our eyes to God again, when we, when we focus on him rather than the, the moment of the day where we felt we, we didn't do well or where we felt we lost it, and then we start focusing too much on that. And we forget that indeed Jesus died on the cross for us to bring freedom to us and to remove the condemnation from our lives, the guilt and condemnation from our lives. So if we refocus our minds instead of in those moments of living in guilt and we refocus our minds to the fact of what Jesus did for us on the cross, I think that helps us. Amen. Titus 2.14 says, who willingly gave himself to be crucified on our behalf to redeem us and purchase our freedom from all wickedness and to purify for himself a chosen and very special people to be his own possession who are enthusiastic for doing what is good. Isn't that a good verse? Jesus gave himself for us because he considers us to be a very special people. Wow, hey? 
a very special people that, that are enthusiastic for doing what is good. That's what he says about you. That you are very special and he sees that you are enthusiastic for doing what is good. He came, he died on the cross for us because that is what he sees in you. He's not looking at you in condemnation. He's not looking at you in guilt, but he's looking at you going, you are my very special people. I came to bring freedom to you. I came to bring deliverance to you. I came to set you free because I see your heart is to do good enthusiastically. Amen? That is our God. You guys doing okay? This isn't a condemning message. This is a good message. I'm going to focus much on Luke 17, 12 to 19. I'm going to say something else first. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> I'm going to tell you of how this message came together. And the reason I'm going to do that is because... I want you to know that I feel it's God's heart for you today. Now that's always my heart when I put a message together that I hear from God for you. What do your people need to hear today, Lord? What do you want to tell them? What do you want to say to them? Because it's not about me or what I might want to preach. It's about what God wants you to hear. That's why I'm here. So I, throughout the week, was pondering what to preach today and had all kinds of ideas circulating in my brain like I always do because I love the word. And then on maybe Wednesday or Thursday, I said, Pastor George, what do you want today? What do you want for Sunday? And this message wasn't part of what was stirring in me through the week. And I had spent the whole day looking at scripture and nothing was settling. I was like, what, what, do, you, what do you want, Lord? What do you want, Lord? And so I asked Pastor George, what do you want? And he says, I want you to talk about how to walk out freedom. I said, awesome. Now this was probably at about 6 o'clock already in the day. I had already spent all day. I think actually this was Thursday, quite honestly. I said, okay. So I sat down, and in a matter of half an hour, had all the scripture references. I hadn't put it all together till Friday, but all the scripture references, boom, boom, boom. This is the beginning, this is the middle, this is the end, and this is how I want you to close. Thank you, Lord. So I put it together on, on uh, Friday, you know, because you've got to copy and paste this and that and everything else. <laughs> that took a lot longer than the half hour of getting the references. And then yesterday I said to Corey, you know, it just feels like, I think it was yesterday anyway, it, feel, it just feels like it just came so easy that, you know, I have to fight not doubting that this is what I'm supposed to be saying today. Because it, just, it just, just came together so easy, but the reality is, is that's really the wrong thinking. It's kind of the opposite. It came together in half an hour because this is what God wants. So I've got much scripture today, but I believe it's what God wants. And I believe he wants to stir up his church. He wants them to remove the guilt and the condemnation that has so held his people down. He doesn't want us to be held down by guilt and condemnation of the day. He wants us to recognize and remember that he came indeed to set us free. He died on the cross for us to set us free. And if he did that, then you know that in scripture he will give us pointers and he will show us how to walk out the freedom that he so desires for us in Jesus' name. Amen? So that's what this is today. And I had on my heart to ask Pastor Dan up here this morning too. And Pastor George thought that was a fantastic idea. So we did that. So Luke 17, 12 and 19, this is about the 10 lepers. Now we know this story. I'm going to read uh, those verses and then concentrate. I'm going to concentrate on verse 19 for you a little bit. But starting at verse 12 says, as he entered, this is Jesus, as Jesus entered a village, uh, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and they raised their voices and called out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Okay. I think I'd be shocked by that, would you? 
And as they went, they were miraculously healed and made clean. So their obedience, maybe they didn't understand, okay, we're coming here, to, we want you to have mercy on us, Jesus, and yet you tell us to leave and go see the priest. But in their obedience, they leave and they're miraculously healed and made clean. Then in verse 15, it says, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying and praising and honoring God with a loud voice. So one of them, one of the ten leopards, when he recognized this miraculous healing, he turned back and he, and he praised God and and, and, and it says, and he, lay fa- and he lay face downward at Jesus' feet, thanking him over and over. He was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were there not ten of you cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was there no one found to return and to give thanks and, pra- and to praise God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, get up and go on your way, your faith your personal trust in me and your confidence in God's power has restored you to health. Now I have preached on this passage before in the, in, in, from a different perspective, but I'm going to talk about it today in the perspective of walking out your freedom. And we're going to concentrate on verse 19. I dug into um, to the Greek on this one, and I think that it is amazing how verse 19 when we just read it in the king james it says and he said unto him arise go thy way thy faith has hath made thee whole it's tough to say in king james but that's king james it was a short short verse but this verse is so packed full it is the the it is just amazing so so here we see this one leopard came back praising god knowing that his miraculous healing was only because of what God did for him. And he wanted nothing more than to give his life to him and praise him and worship him because he came back and he knelt down at Jesus' feet. One of the ten. And he was the one that God said, that, that God said to, to go and he said that, that your faith has made thee whole. So he wasn't just miraculously healed, but he was made whole. He came back to be made whole. Because you can be miraculously healed in your physical body, but your innards could still be hurting. Your innards may still need healing. But he came back to the source of who he knew could make him whole. And he praised him. And I think that we need to first remember that. Verse 19. And he said to him, arise. This arise means to stand up. It means um, of those who leave a place to go elsewhere. Now that seems obvious, right? But let's think about that. Who leave a place to go elsewhere. Remember Pastor Dan talked about how he had to leave where he had been. He had to leave the circumstances. He had to leave the environment and go elsewhere. So God says to him, arise, stand up and go elsewhere. It also means of those who prepare themselves for the journey. Now, did you hear this? We're only halfway into the short, the short verse. And that one word, arise, is to stand up, to go elsewhere. And not only that, but to prepare yourself for the journey ahead. That's not just a one-moment thing. Prepare yourself. Prepare your innards for that journey. Renew your mind for the journey. Think ahead about what you're going to need to walk into that journey. Think ahead about the, how to walk out that freedom. Not, it's not just the moment by moment, but it's preparing for the journey. Amen? And he said to him, Arise, go thy way. Now, go thy way is to go, to depart, to pursue the journey on which one has entered, to continue on the journey. So to pursue the journey. So now you're not just getting prepared. You're not just preparing yourself for the journey, but you're pursuing it. You're keeping your mind on it. You're keeping your, your, every part of you fixed on it. Instead of looking back, you're looking forward at that journey. Amen? 
It also means to follow one, that is, become his adherent. Now, that's what go thy way means, to follow someone, to become their adherent. Now, if we, if we uh, look at that a little bit deeper, um, what does it look like when we adhere to Jesus Christ, right? So it's not just go thy way and just, just go, but it's go and stick, right? Go and adhere. And now, I looked up adhere in the dictionary because I think words are awesome. And it actually means um, someone who supports a particular party, person, or set of ideas. So, we support Jesus Christ. We take on his ideas. We support him as a person. It also means a follower. We follow him. So go thy way and follow Jesus. Go thy way and adhere to him. Support, uphold, defend, advocate. Be a disciple, a devotee, a friend, a true believer, a worshiper. All of these words actually mean are, are, are part of adherent. Whoa. It also means stick fast to an object or surface. Go on your journey and stick fast to the Lord. Isn't that good? Not stick slow, stick fast. Isn't it amazing how much you can get a one small scripture? And we're not done yet. <laughs> and he said to him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith. By faith, faith in God, faith in Jesus, faith in who he is, faith in what he did on the cross for you. It also means this, fidelity, faithfulness, and the character of one who can be relied on. Whoa, now we're talking about his character. Jesus saw him and he saw his character. He saw that he was someone who could be relied on. He saw that he was someone who had faith in Jesus Christ. Someone who had faith in God. Someone who had faith to know that if he went back to God and praised and worshipped him, that he would be made whole. Character. Build your character. Prepare your character for the journey. Amen? And lastly, and he said to him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Hath made thee whole. Saved you, made you whole, healed you. It also means it, it keeps you safe and sound. To rescue you from danger or destruction. So what rescues you? Hmm. His faith in God protects him, rescues him, covers him. It also means to save from the evils which obstruct the reception of the messianic deliverance. Did you hear that? To save from the evils that obstruct the reception of your deliverance. So stand up, hold fast, stick fast to Jesus Christ. Become his disciple, his follower, build up your character, prepare for your journey. As you heard before, the deliverance the Pastor Dan experience wasn't just one time. It was over a series of months where there was a freedom happening as deliverance was happening, as he was ready, as he was preparing himself. And this, this needs to be a part of that. It doesn't just happen in one session. It doesn't just happen in one prayer time. We need to hold fast and stick fast to God in that journey. And as he, we renew our minds to the mind of Christ and he shows us those things that we need to change, there is a protection there that happens. There is a protection there that he saves us from the past if we don't look back. Amen? Amen. 
That brings me to my next verse. Luke 9, 62. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back to the things left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. That's the scripture. Luke 9, 62. I'm going to read it again. But Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back to the things left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. Why is that? We make a decision to move ahead to prepare for our journey. We make a decision to allow God to cover us. We make a decision to love him with all of our hearts and all of our minds and all of our being. We make a decision to walk our lives out in righteousness and trust him that even in those days and in those moments where we may not feel like complete healing or freedom have, have come, that we continue to trust him no matter what we see. No matter what we see. And we continue to praise and worship him for who he is. And we don't look back. And why do we not look back? Because he knows what it would do to us. We don't look back. Now, one more Greek reference. This word looks back, looks, simple word. This is what it means. To perceive by senses and to feel. So don't look back. Don't. Don't go back to those senses, to those feelings, to those urges of the past. It means also to discover by use or know by experience. Don't go back to it. Don't experience it again. Don't give in to the longings that want to bring you back into addiction patterns. Don't give in to those longings that want to bring you into places of destruction in Jesus' name. It also means to turn the thoughts or direct the mind to a thing. If you find that your mind and your thoughts are going back and missing things of old, it says don't go there. Don't turn your mind to it. Don't consider it. Don't contemplate it. Don't look at it. Don't weigh it carefully. Don't examine it. Don't even go there. Don't look at it. In any part of your being, don't turn that way physically. Don't get your mind there. Don't get your emotions there. Don't remember the feelings. Let go of it. And if you need help to let go of it, then find someone that can help you to let go of it. But don't go back. Because God knows that going back is going to pull you back there. It's going to stop that process of healing and freedom that you were walking in. Don't go back. Sometimes it's so easy, I think, for people to, to look back because there's a day of struggle and there's a forgetting that in all of those years of God's faithfulness in your life, that, that, that in that moment of deep heaviness, that, that there may be a moment of, of wanting to look back. But God says, don't look back, look forward, because I have something more for you. I have something more for you. And just when, just when you think that we're not getting anywhere anymore, that's usually the place where you've got to push through again. You've got to break down that last wall. Because when you break down that last wall, victory is there. It's right around the corner. But if you look back, you'll miss it. Don't look back. Amen? God's word is so powerful. There's so much in it. I love his word. Amen? Yes, Lord. Right now, I hear God telling me that there's people here that just want, want to really hunger for his word more than they do. They have that desire, but it's just not there. I'm just going to pray right now because I believe that God just wants to stir that up in you. So if that's you, you just take it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I stir up within you that desire, that hunger, that thirst for more of God's word, that hunger and thirst for more of his relationship that comes out of his word. I ask, Lord God, for divine revelation in those appointed times when they read the word when they read the word lord god that you'd visit them that you'd visit them with your presence that you'd visit them with your relationship that they become united to you again in a stronger way in jesus name amen
All right. We're going to go a little quicker now through the scriptures. Romans 12, verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and what? Progressively changed. Progressively changed. It's a journey. It's a process. Progressively changed as you mature spiritually every day, every day. By the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself. So you may prove to God? No. So that you may prove to yourself what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. His plan and his purpose for you. So... Why does he want us to renew our minds to those things of God so we can prove to ourselves and know and know that we know what his will for us is, what his purpose is for us? It's not to, it's not to find, a, you know, yes, that's a very religious lie right there, where we think we got to dig into the word and think we have to renew our mind to please God. Let's just get that out of there right now. He loves us. He wants us to dig into his word. He wants us to get to know him more because he loves us. And he wants us to know his will and his purpose for us. Amen. Ephesians 4.23 says, And be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, un untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. Be continually renewed. Galatians 2, 4 to 5 says, My concern was, because of the false brothers, those people masquerading as Christians, who had been secretly smuggled in to the community of believers, they had slipped in to spy on the freedom which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us back into bondage under the law of Moses. But we did not yield to them even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel would continue to remain with you in its purity. So why am I reading this seemingly random scripture suddenly? Isn't that, isn't that interesting that there were those in the church, he's talking about those that would come in and masquerade as Christians because they want to spy on the freedom and they want to take the freedom away. What? Now I, I know today that looks similar but yet different than it did then. But there are people, knowingly and unknowingly, sometimes it's, it's, it's purposed, but sometimes I don't think it's purposed. But there is this, the, the, the reality is, is that misery loves company, and you know this. Misery loves company. And if there's a freedom that they see in someone that is not understood, it is easy to say, well, that's of the devil. Or it's easy to say, well, I don't believe it. Because I know what that person went through and how, what, how they lived all before this. And I don't think that God could just come in and bring that kind of freedom to somebody. There's going to be many, many naysayers like that. May not voice those words. They might. But there'll be an inner, thi inner conversation going on. Do not allow them to steal your freedom. Do not allow them to speak those negative words over you. God came to set you free. And God is all-powerful. And you know what some of those sentences and words and conversations might be even going on in your own head. 
where you doubt your own healing. Is that even possible? Look what I did in this life. That's condemnation. That's not from God. God came to set you free. And sometimes to walk out freedom does mean letting go of some things that would keep you from that freedom. But like Pastor Dan said, there is grace that comes on you as a believer when you choose to keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. When you choose to keep your eyes focused on Him and His plans and purposes for you. When you choose to keep your eyes focused on the journey ahead and prepare your heart and your mind and your body and every part of you for that journey, then God's grace comes on you and strengthens you in those moments where you want to look back. Keep standing firm. Galatians 5 verse 1 says it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject again to the yoke of slavery which you, which you once removed. So he says, keep standing firm in those moments, in all the moments. Keep standing firm. Don't let that slavery grab a hold of you again. Don't let the yoke of sin grab a hold of you again. And if you have, quickly run back to God. Quickly run back to him. Quickly stick to him again in Jesus' name. Amen? God will always take you back. Keep a serving heart. What? Yes. Keep a serving heart. Galatians 5.13 says, For you, my brothers, were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the sinful nature, the worldliness, and the selfishness. But through love, serve and seek the best for one another. I think that this verse, this passage is huge. It is very, very easy to turn inward. It is very, very easy to turn selfish and think it's about us. We're human. It just happens. But God says don't allow that freedom to be an opportunity to go back into the sinful nature. But instead keep your eyes focused ahead of you. Keep your eyes focused on serving. Keep your eyes focused on loving. Instead of me, make it about them. Instead of me, make it about the person in front of you. Learn how to love that person that's in your family. Learn what makes them tick. When you keep your eyes focused on learning how to love somebody and how to serve them, there isn't any room in your brain for anything else but God working through you to love. And that is our number one commandment. And you know what? Because it's our number one commandment, I would think that that one commandment to love one another, to love, to love, 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 right? We hear this all the time. But if that's our number one commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our being, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, if we do that one commandment, and we put someone else above ourselves. We put our serving hearts on instead of looking internally at self. I believe we'll walk out our freedom. And the desires of the past will fade very quickly. Amen. Pastor Dan said that much of his healing came from connecting with the body of Christ. And he came and he served even when he didn't feel like it. And so you might be thinking, yeah, but I don't have something in the church to do. I'm not up there on worship to come every time. No, but you know what you do have? You have somebody in your life to love and to serve whether it's your family, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your coworker, and that 
is serving. A closing scripture is this, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. But whenever a person turns in repentance and faith to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now this, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty from bondage and true freedom. And we all, with unveiled, fa with unveiled face, continually seeing, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory which comes from the lord who is the spirit so every day that we have breath every day that we have life is another moment to go from glory to glory another moment to progressively be transformed into his image and now god himself says that it's progressive so I ask you to be patient with yourself. I ask you to love yourself. Not get so hard on yourself. Amen. One closing quote that I posted this week on Facebook, if you saw it, I really like it. Be patient with yourself. Self-growth is tender. It's holy ground. There is no greater investment. Isn't that good? I'm going to read that quote again because it's just so good. <laughs> Be patient with yourself. Self-growth is tender. It's holy ground. There's no greater investment. You are walking on holy ground. You have been made in the image of your God. You are valuable. You are worth it. Amen.